alive um, to live out our faith um, by reflecting the love and the life of Jesus in all that we do. And this morning, I want to start with a song called Build Your Kingdom. And it's a bold prayer for us to pray this morning. But I want to invite us to do that, to boldly sing this song and to boldly pray the words, Lord, let your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so this morning, what you bring with you to this morning into worship, just say, Lord, take this, let your will be done, your kingdom come in my life in this situation. And so, and also feel free, this is like one of those knee slapper type songs, so you can clap. All the way through. Uh, PK was saying, yeah, I lived in West Virginia. We had washboards and, you know, jugs. <laughs> and uh, so if you have a jug or a washboard, you know, pull it out. Um, but, um, but let's boldly pray this morning this beautiful prayer. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope, like wildfire in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come invade us now. We are your church, and we The captive's hearts released, the hurt, and the sick, the poor, and peace. We lay down your lives for heaven's cause. We are your church, and we pray revive this earth.
Let the darkness fear. Show your mighty hand. Heal our streets and land. Set your church on fire. Swim this nation back. Change the atmosphere. Build your kingdom here. We pray. waited patiently for the Lord and he heard my cry he lifted me out of that slimy pit out of the mud and mire he set my feet upon the rock a firm place to stand he put a new song in my mouth a hymn of praise to sing to my God let's wait on him this morning seek his face intentionally today If faith can move the mountains, let the mountains move. We come with expectation, waiting here for you. Waiting here for you.
before you. Lord, you are a steady and firm foundation for our feet. And so God, um, as we hear your word preached this morning, help us to respond to it and uh, help us to dive into the gospel story full-hearted in your name. Amen. Let's take a moment and greet one another this morning. Morning, boys. Well, we are uh, concluding our series called Daring Church. Will we dare to believe that God is really able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine? Will we dare to pray bold prayers? Will we dare to make uh, daring sacrifices for the cause of Christ, knowing that and when we sacrifice for him, whether it's our time, our resources, whether it's resisting temptation, whether it's witnessing to another person, that there is blessing that comes now and in eternity. Will we be a daring church? We've been looking in this series at words that Jesus spoke to ancient churches, praises and also warnings to learn from them uh, so that we will do the things that God praises the church for, and we will not fall into the trap of the warnings that he gave to these churches back in the book of Revelation about 2,000 years ago. That's what we're going to look at again, Revelation chapter 3, very easy to find, last book in the Bible. You can open up your device or your Bible in front of you, and while you're doing that, open up to Revelation 3, I want to show you a picture. This is a picture of a restaurant and, and bar, and it's located in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. See the beautiful architecture? You know why? Because it's a church. It's actually called Church Brew Works. See the high ceilings? There's stained glass windows. And I read, I haven't been there, that you can really get really good food and really, really good service there. But there's something sad in me about having dinner in a place that used to be a church. What once used to be a shining light in the community now has booths and televisions. Where they once served up grace and truth, now they're serving up burgers and fries. People are having a good time. Nothing wrong with that. But nobody's eternity is being changed anymore. That church is no longer a force for good in the community. It's no longer a beacon of hope. It is no longer pushing back the forces of darkness. Where there once was a daring church praying bold prayers, living with daring faith, it's no longer there. 
And what is heartbreaking is experts say that there's between seven and 10,000 churches that will close this year around the world. Churches that are singing their last song, closing their doors, saying their last prayer. So we're looking at this third and final church in the book of Revelation. And it's a letter written to the church in Sardis. And I'm starting in Revelation chapter 3, verse 1. To the angel, or the messenger of the church in Sardis, write. So Jesus is talking to this church in Sardis, but he wants to use the city of Sardis as an example to them. And the city of Sardis once was one of the most powerful cities in the Mediterranean world. At one time, a very wealthy Persian city. It's actually a place where some of the first coins were minted for monetary exchange. It was a city of luxurious decadence. But by the time it was incorporated into the Roman Empire, it was kind of a relic, kind of a shell of what it once was. And the inhabitants in that city could only look to their past for glory. And Jesus was saying to the church in Sardis, you know what happened to this city. Be careful because it's starting to happen to you. Which is so sad because Jesus says this. These are the words of him, that is Jesus, who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Jesus says, I'm the one who have the seven spirits of God. As I said last week, uh, seven is a, a symbolic number in Revelation that refers to the completion, the fullness, the perfection of God. Jesus is saying, I am the one who has the fullness of the Spirit. In the Old Testament, uh, the Spirit is sometimes referred to as this, the sevenfold ministry of the Spirit. And so the prophet Isaiah lists them as the Spirit of the Lord and wisdom and understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, and the fear of the Lord. And what Jesus is saying is, I'm the one who sends out the fullness of the Spirit to the church. And Jesus is present in his church through the Spirit. And it seems like the church in Sardis is resisting the work of the Spirit, rejecting the Spirit, not remaining sensitive to the Holy Spirit's work in their life. One of the most popular, longest-running television shows is called CSI. You know what that stands for, right? Crime Scene Investigation. I think that's what it stands for. I don't watch it a whole lot, but in that show, uh, pretty much every show, I think somebody gets murdered and they have to figure out the cause of why they, why they died. And oftentimes they will use or do an autopsy on the body to figure it out. It's amazing what you can learn by doing an autopsy on the body. Historians say the very first autopsy that was ever done was actually done on Julius Caesar to try to figure out which wound was actually the fatal one that killed him. But the first public autopsy on the body of the church was done by Jesus. Kind of church scene investigation here in Revelation 3. Jesus says this, I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. There's that word again. He uses it over and over with the letters to the churches. So often people, and even Christians, think of that word repent as kind of a harsh word, as a judgmental word. And unfortunately, sometimes people have used it, Christians have used it that way as a kind of club but biblical repentance always leads to life. And why does Jesus say this to the churches over and over? Because the life of the Christian is to be a life of repentance. Repentance is just simply turning and going back to Jesus over and over again. He must increase, we must decrease. And what Jesus is doing through these letters is he's trying to get these churches ready for greatness in the kingdom of God. He's trying to get them ready for the challenges that they are going to face. And so he says, repent, come back to me. The way that you see Jesus great and glorious in your life is through repentance. For Jesus to get bigger and your worries and your fears to become smaller, it is through repentance. Repentance brings about peace in our lives because we're going back to Jesus. 
The only way to greatness, the only way to rise to the occasion, the only way, Jesus says, is through repentance. Come back to me. God made a covenant with you at your baptism. And he said, I am yours, and, and I love you with an everlasting love. And you can come back to me at any time. And here's the irony. Unless you know that you're missing God, you'll miss God. Right? Unless you know there is more to life, you'll miss out on life. It's only the church and only the Christian who says we're missing out on God that finds God. It's only the, the Christian that says um, we are losing our first love that keeps their first love. It's only the church and the Christian that says we're not being all that God wants us to be that become what God wants us to be. The church in Sardis has this great reputation in the community, doing marvelous things, but Jesus says, you're dead. Dead men walking. Like the little kid in the movie Sixth Sense, I see dead people. Jesus sees that. He sees what's going on spiritually. That's kind of frightening, isn't it? especially because these words are for churches for all time. Can we really not be aware that we are dead spiritually? Can we actually be asleep at the wheel and not even realize it? You know, when you read this letter to, to Sardis, there's nothing in this letter from Jesus that says that like, they're uh, accepting false doctrine. They seem to be all for sound biblical teaching. Many of the other churches, as you look at them, you see that there's some kind of false teaching or heresy that slips into the congregation, and, and Jesus has to correct them for that. But it seems like this church hasn't diluted the pure teaching of the apostles handed down to them. So the church is not entertaining false doctrine. They're doing great things, have a great reputation in the community. On the outside, they look great. But Jesus says, on the inside, you're dead. Or you're asleep. See, we know they're not totally spiritually dead because Jesus says, wake up. Dead people don't wake up, right? And later he says, be watchful and strengthen what remains. So what Jesus is saying is there is a sleepiness that is going on. There is a loss of being aware of reality. Wake up. And oftentimes in Scripture, death and sleep are interchanged back and forth, okay? Okay. So what's going on is this church is saying in, in Sardis, like, we're doing all kinds of good things, and, and that's really all that matters. Don't worry about sound doctrine. Don't worry about the work of the Spirit and being sensitive to the Spirit and obedient to the Spirit. Don't worry about this thing, you know, this full devotion to Christ. Let's just make sure we're doing nice, good things. God cares about what is going on in your heart. Jesus cares very deeply what you believe about him. And sometimes churches will say, sometimes whole denominations will, will say, it doesn't matter what we believe as long as we're doing loving deeds in the community and we get along. See how that works in a loving relationship that you have in your life. Try that out with your spouse. Try that out. Say, honey, what do you believe about me? Honey, it doesn't matter what I believe about you. I don't care what I believe about you as long as I do loving deeds for you. That is not how marriage works. It, it doesn't work that way. There needs to be an inner reality of love and knowledge. That's what makes lasting good deeds possible. Outer duty without inner reality is like a tire without air. Ultimately, it goes flat, right? And Jesus says to the people at Sardis, you're going to sleep spiritually. Wake up before it's too late. I actually have a book in my library called An Autopsy of a Deceased Church. And the authors studied churches all over the world and why they closed their doors. And there's lots of similarities. One of them that he found is um, doctrine becomes less and less important, what they believe. Uh, another thing is that he finds they're always looking to the past and the glory days of the past. Another big thing he found is the people out there, they're the problem, and they get angry with them. 
rather than having pity for them because they're lost. And lost people, they do foolish things. They go down foolish roads. They're lost. Why in the world would we be angry at them? They don't know Christ. Most churches start out, when you look at their history, they start out with a passion for Jesus. They start out with a vision to do everything they can to introduce more people to Jesus Christ, to make the name of Jesus more famous. It starts as a movement, and then they begin to organize. Nothing wrong with organizing. You need to do that. You need to have structure and processes. In fact, if you don't have that, that can actually cap or put a ceiling on uh, the movement. So churches need to organize, but what happens when they organize is they begin to lose the why of why they organize. Why do we do what we do? It's always about the mission of Jesus. It is to glorify Jesus. It is to love Jesus. It's to point people to Jesus. It's to build people up in Jesus. And then what happens next is the church becomes an institution. And that's where many churches are in America today. No one being led to Jesus. No one is making professions of faith. No one is being baptized. Darkness is not being pushed back in the community. And many churches stop dreaming about what is possible, and they only focus on what is predictable. And if you become an institution and you do not repent and go back to your first love, then you become a museum. Go over to Western Europe, and you can see all kinds of beautiful cathedrals that are a literal museum. You can go and you can have tours done. And you can put a little change in, you can light some candles. But that's what they are. They're just relics. And the church at Sardis ceased to be a movement. They ceased to believe that we really do have the hope of the world. Friends, I hope you know this. The hope of the world is not political solutions. The hope of the world is not economic solutions. The hope of the world is not educational solutions. All those things are great things. But the hope of the world is a gospel solution. The gospel of Jesus really does heal hurting people. The gospel of Jesus really does break chains of addiction. The gospel really does include the excluded. The gospel really does create true inner love for the poor, and for kingdom justice. The gospel really does set people free with forgiveness of their sins. The gospel really does bring hope for life and eternity. That's why we have to continue to have daring steps of faith to step out in trust. The reason why we risk lavishly for the center of hope is so that more and more people ultimately would come to know Jesus Christ. The reason why we risk lavishly to start a new campus out in more and more people will come to know Jesus Christ. The inner reality of Jesus and love for him is the fountain for all of our good deeds. And so we need to keep walking by faith. Walking, right? That's movement. Don't be stagnant. Don't fall asleep. When Jesus says, you are dead, wake up, he's not talking to unbelievers. Now, unbelievers are spiritually dead. They need to be awakened by the Holy Spirit. That, that's conversion. But here he's talking to Christians. He's saying, you're almost dead. You're in this deep sleep. You've got a pulse. Your heart is beating. That's good. But you need more. And I've said this many times, Jesus did not come to make bad people good. He came to make dead people alive. First, he does that by conversion, by waking us up. Spiritually dead makes us spiritually alive. But he also has to keep waking us up. That's the Christian life. Keep bringing us back to him so that he is more real uh, in our life. We're more awake to him and his kingdom reality. It is possible for many Christians in churches across this land to be like what William Wallace in Braveheart says. Every man dies, but not every man really lives. Jesus wants us to go through life fully awake 
to him and his presence. Jesus doesn't want us to sleep through what he is doing. He wants us to be awake to what he wants to do through us. You know, a church can be falling asleep long before they lose their reputation in the community. So let's just talk a little bit about sleep. I mean, think about sleep, right? When you sleep, what's happening? You're controlled by fantasies and dreams, not by reality. If I'm asleep, I can be dreaming great things, and there's actually a thief in my house, and I don't even know it. When I wake up, I'm awake to reality. When I'm asleep, what is insignificant or not lasting becomes very significant, right? And very real. And what is truly significant can seem very insignificant. Like when I am asleep and my wife pushes me, I think I heard somebody downstairs. I'm like, oh, yeah, tell me in the morning when I wake up, right? Because I'm half asleep. I don't even realize it. Jesus says, wake up. Because to be asleep spiritually means Jesus doesn't have the reality in our lives that he should. See, when you're asleep spiritually, your financial security and your job security and your health security actually becomes more substantive and significant and important than Jesus does in your life. It's because we're not awake fully to him. One of the reasons why I keep encouraging you to make worship the first priority of your week is so that Jesus stays significant and important and substantive to you. Because when you are in worship, right, Jesus becomes more real. You wake up to more of who he is. Tim Keller, in his fantastic book, uh, Counterfeit Gods, I'd encourage you to put it on your 2023 uh, reading list. He talks about how we have so many different counterfeit gods. We put other gods before the true God. And when that happens, sooner or later, there's always going to be negative ramifications that come with that false god. Not in sense of punishment, but it's just negative ramifications. So when we are asleep, something other than Jesus becomes more real, more weightier than him. And then eventually there's going to be negative consequences to it. Let me just give you some examples. Uh, we worry, right? I worry all the time. You worry. What is going on deep beneath worry? When you pull worry up by the roots and you really analyze it and examine it, what is going on? Jesus' wisdom is not as significant or substantial as the wisdom of the world. That's what's going on. The more his wisdom and his truth and the promises of his word become real, you become awake to, you will worry less. Another example, all of us struggle with self-esteem issues at times, right? And there's lots of different factors of this, I know, but low self-esteem, when you actually pull it up by the roots, what's behind that is too small of a view of Jesus and his love. Parents, free little advice here. You want your children to have healthy self-esteem? Then make Jesus and his love bigger in their life. Let them know he's the one who created them fearfully and wonderfully made. And he redeemed them because he loves them so much. And he has a divine life. And nothing will change his love and affirmation for them. And he loves them with an infinite love so much bigger than yours. And that will never change. And watch their esteem. Go up. See, repentance, going back to Jesus. Here's another reason uh, why the gospel is, is so beautiful. And the more we live out of it, life just gets better. Oftentimes, people will say to me, some of you have said to me, I know God forgives, but I can't forgive myself. I just still carry around the guilt and the shame. So you built, beat yourself up. And you have regrets and you focus on your failures and your sins. What is going on there? Your sins are more real. You're more awake to your sins than Jesus' complete perfect sacrifice for your sins. 
If you wake up, Jesus' death on the cross becomes more real to you than your sins. Jesus' love becomes greater than your failures. You are living more in reality than in sleepiness. If you can't feel forgiven, if you don't know that your slate is clean, that as far as the east is uh, from the west, so far your sins have been removed from you through faith in Jesus Christ, it's because you are asleep spiritually. You don't get the reality of the gospel. Wake up, it says. One last example. If you struggle uh, with self-control, you know why that is? And we all do. That's because at that moment, Jesus' ways, his commands, his um, standards don't carry as much weight for you as what the experts say and what the peers say. Wake up, Jesus says. You're more afraid of what others say than what Jesus says. What Jesus thinks of you has to be weightier than what other people think of you. Jesus says, wake up to the spiritual reality. So, how do we wake up? Jesus says this, strengthen what remains and is about to die. Strengthen what is most important. Stay flexible, yes, take calculated risks, take big steps of faith, try new things, but always strengthen the foundational core beliefs. There are some things that will never change. Hebrews 13 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change. His, uh, his word says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Some things never change. And people want foundational truths to build their life upon. And in a culture that can't remain the same for even one week with shifting worldviews and moral relativism and multiple choice values and talk show truths, isn't it wonderful to know that we can build our lives upon something that will never change God's word and the gospel of Jesus Christ? Jesus says, strengthen your core beliefs. A huge, huge part of our core beliefs here at Hope is what a disciple looks like, the five Gs. It begins with the gospel. Everything begins. That's our motivation and our foundation. Then we gather in worship so that Jesus becomes more real and bigger in our lives. And then we grow in love for God and love for people. And I know you're a very loving person, but get around people who are different from you and then show me how much you love people. So we gather together. Then we give. We give in service to the one who has given everything to us. And then we go in mission because everybody needs to hear about the gospel that Jesus died and rose again. And Jesus says this, I have found your deeds unfinished. Do you believe that we're not finished yet? I believe that heaven is cheering us on right now. Do you believe that our best days are still in front of us? Death in the future comes from loving only the past. What fresh things do we want God to do in us? Are we praying, God, what do you want to do in us and through us? What things do we need to complete with the Center for Hope, with our Brockport campus, with our Greece campus? Then Jesus says this, but if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. So Sardis, the city, was built on a mountain, and it had a strong fortress. And throughout its history, there were two times, 549 and 218 B.C., where it was besieged by two different armies. And how did they do it? As they scaled the walls in the middle of the night when everybody was asleep. See, when we are asleep, again, we don't know that there's a thief in the house. Jesus is not saying that he is a thief. What he's saying is, I don't want you to miss me. I don't want you to miss what I am doing, what I'm up to. Remember, Jesus is the one who holds the Spirit in his hands. He sends the Spirit. He fills the Spirit. 
We have received the Spirit, and the Spirit is the one who makes us new, who gives us strength and perseverance. Remember the Spirit's work. Be sensitive and obedient to the Spirit. Stay alive and awake to the Spirit. Because if the church is not supernatural, it becomes superficial really, really quickly. And there are some things that only God can do. And so we need humble prayers and acknowledge that we are utterly dependent upon him. That's part of the reason why this 21 days of prayer, I've been sending out to the prayer app, prayers for you to pray. Part of the 21 days of prayer is this Wednesday morning uh, at our Greece campus at 6.30 a.m. to 7. Chris and I are just going to lead a time of worship and a time of prayer. We're also going to stream it so you can begin your day that way. If you come here at 7 o'clock when we're done, if you have prayer needs, we will stay and pray with you, however long there are people here. And maybe you want to just pray some bold prayers, daring prayers for healing, or maybe daring prayers for that person that you know that they would come to Christ, or daring prayers of, God, how, how can you use me more this year? Remember what only God can do. I don't know about you, but I'm clinging to that. Because when I think about this year and the things that we want to accomplish and, and trying to provide a primary health care to the poor in our community, for the goals that we have set for the Brockport campus, to try to make every person not just a disciple of Jesus, but a disciple maker of Jesus. When I think about the next generation and all the various ministries in this place and all the resources that it takes, when I look just through human eyes, become fearful really, really quickly. But when I get down on my knees and I pray, God, not by might, not by power, but by your spirit, O Lord, you will accomplish these things. Let's not forget the supernatural part of hope. You know, we've been so blessed by God, and to whom much is given, much is required, Jesus says. And then Jesus closes this way. Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. What that means, who, who have not uh, walked in sin and darkness of unbelief. Okay? They walk with me, dressed in white, for they are worthy. The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my Father and his angels. The only way to greatness is through repentance. And true biblical repentance does not make you feel bad about yourself. I mean, you'll feel bad about what you did, but it doesn't make you feel bad about yourself. You don't get depressed with biblical repentance. Why? Because when we go back to what we knew at first, the gospel and what Jesus did for us, he says, you will be dressed in white robes. What does that mean? We'll be clean, we'll be forgiven, we'll be covered with his righteousness and his holiness. That's what comes from it. Jesus says, I will give you a crown. I'll write your name in the book of life. And when Jesus writes your name in the book of life, nobody is going to face it. And then he says this, I will confess your name before my Father and the angels. I will acknowledge your name. Think about that for a moment. There's going to come a day when God is going to take you by the hand and he's going to walk you up to the angels and the archangels. And if you've ever done a study on angels in the scriptures, they are amazing creatures. In fact, if we didn't know they were angels, we'd be tempted to bow down and worship them. And Jesus is going to stand you before them and then take you before the throne of God and he's going to say, this one is my child. This one is my son and my daughter whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. He's going to acknowledge you before the Father and the angels. He who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Would you bow your heads in prayer with me? Oh, Lord Jesus, would you wake us up? Help us to not sleep spiritually through life. And Lord God, if there are any here in this room or hearing my voice right now who are spiritually dead, 
who have never trusted, believed, received, have never acknowledged their sins and their need for a Savior, would you wake them up to the reality of a Savior in Jesus Christ? And for those, for those of us who are yours, oh God, we pray that we would return to you and the gospel each day. Lord God, may this be a year of spiritual growth for each of us as we prioritize you and our relationship with you. Lord God, would you give us strength and perseverance to complete every work that you have called us to. May you give to us the fullness of your spirit to let him direct and lead and strengthen in supernatural ways all that we do. May we be a church that dares to believe, that dares to love you with our whole heart, that dares to sacrifice in whatever way that you call us, that dares to take big steps of faith for your glory and so that heaven will be more crowded. In Jesus' name, amen. What gives the grace is Jesus, my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. For my life is wholly bound to Him. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing. All is mine, yet not I, but through Christ.
Jesus, for he has said that he will bring me home. And day by day, I know he will renew me until I stand with joy before the throne. To this I Oh, 
your presence, Lord, and that you give us hope, not the counterfeit gods who promise us something less than hope, that seek to rob, kill, and destroy. But God, open our hearts to your truth today and to live in your hope that only comes from Jesus. In your name, amen. So we want to invite anyone who would love to uh, participate in communion just over here. Our pastors um, will... um, give you communion and pray over you today. But if not, have a wonderful day, a blessed day.